Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a brand new review. In the past, this channel has been exclusively focused on PlayStation exclusives. However, now that Sly 4 is finally done and over with, I'm ready to get a move on with this channel and talk about many other games I've played from several different franchises and systems. So to start with, I'm talking about the first in a series that I've only recently gotten into, and that would be Metal Gear. One of the most beloved franchises in video game history, whether it be the memorable characters, satisfying gameplay, and an ongoing storyline that took almost 30 years to unfold. For many people, Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation was where the series began, since it was the series' first time on the mainstream. Unless you count the NES titles, but I feel like by 1998, most people had just forgotten about those two games. How did I first come across Metal Gear? Well, I saw Snake in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, but it wasn't until the fall of 2015 where I purchased the Metal Gear Solid Legacy Collection for the PlayStation 3, containing all the main titles in the series with the exception of Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops for the PSP. So I played Metal Gear Solid 1 on the PSN, but honestly, I really didn't care for it that much. Since in my mind at the time, stealth games was Sly Cooper, where the guards were complete idiots, but Metal Gear Solid really wanted you to be sneaking around the guards, and so I never got that far into the game. That was until February of 2016 where I tried the game again and really got into it. And so here we are today. I'm not the biggest Metal Gear fanboy in the world since I've never played the Acid games or Ghost Babble before. In addition to that, I enjoy Portable Ops more than Peace Walker, I liked the Twin Snakes, I think Sons of Liberty is better than the original, and I thought the Phantom Pain's ending made perfect sense. So anyway, for today's episode I'm reviewing Metal Gear for the MSX2 as well as the NES port that followed it. I should point out that this is not a marathon, since the next marathon is coming up soon, and so I'm just going to be doing solo reviews until then. How did Metal Gear come to be, you may ask? As you all probably know, Metal Gear was created by a man known as Hideo Kojima, creator of several beloved games, one of those being Metal Gear. In the late 80s, a popular system in Japan was the MSX2, which Konami had published several titles on. Konami went to the military action game on the MSX, since that was one of the most popular genres at the time. Hideo Kojima was the director of this project, but he had to inform Konami that the MSX just couldn't handle that much intensity and if it tried, then the game would be a technical mess. And so, he thought it should become a game where you have to avoid detection at all costs. Konami was weary of the idea, but willing to give it a shot. And so they did, and the game was received very well. So just to put things in perspective, essentially what Super Mario Bros. did for platformers and what The Legend of Zelda did for adventure games is what Metal Gear did for stealth games. So with all that out of the way, let's start with the story. And if you weren't expecting much given the fact that this game is from the late 80s, I think you'll be surprised. In the year 1995, 200 kilometers north of Galsburg, South Africa, an army nation known as Outer Heaven is established, and the West has received word of this. Special Forces Unit Foxhound is in charge of taking them out. Big Boss sends the top agent, Grey Fox, into Outer Heaven to receive info on what's going on, but he gets captured and sends an emergency transmission, his last words being Metal Gear, which is a bipedal nuclear tank that can fire a nuclear missile to and from any point on the planet. As a last ditch effort to take down Outer Heaven, Big Boss sends in the rookie Solid Snake to rescue Grey Fox, gather more info about Outer Heaven, destroy Metal Gear, and defeat Outer Heaven's mysterious leader. Thus commencing Operation Intrude N313. And if you don't want spoilers from almost 30 year game, skip to this point in the video. Solid Snake finds Grey Fox as well as rescuing other hostages. Grey Fox tells Snake about the details of Metal Gear and then he needs to find Dr. Drago Petrovich Modnar, the creator of Metal Gear, and ask him how to destroy it. Snake's mission is occasionally interrupted by Outer Heaven's mercenaries consisting of the Shot Maker, Machine Gun Kid, the Fire Trooper, Bloody Brad, and Dirty Duck. But honestly, other than that, I couldn't tell you much else about these characters themselves. Snake finds Madnar and he says he won't help until Snake rescues his daughter Ellen from captivity. And so he does, and Madnar says Snake needs to use plastic explosives to destroy Metal Gear's legs. As Snake continues his mission, Big Boss continues to act stranger and stranger, leading Snake into death traps and even telling him to turn off the console. This is explained later since the hostage alerts Snake that Big Boss is truly the leader of Outer Heaven and sent Solid Snake in on a suicide mission, but he was better than anyone could have expected and destroyed Metal Gear itself. Big Boss tries to defeat Snake, but Snake kills Big Boss and escapes Outer Heaven as it explodes, ending Operation Intrude and 313. The story of Metal Gear is pretty simple, but I think the game's writing is pretty good with a few good plot twists here and there. In-depth details of what happened during the Outer Heaven Uprising, like what Big Boss's motivations are, will be told in later games like Metal Gear 2, Snake Eater, Guns of the Patriots, and The Phantom Pain. But for now, this is the story. Who is Solid Snake? Who are his parents? All things revealed in later games, whether they take place before or after this game. So now we move on to the gameplay. Controlling Snake is pretty simple. The game plays from a top-down perspective, and you make Snake move in four directions, up, down, left, and right with the D-pad. At the beginning of the game, Snake has nothing except a pack of cigarettes on his side, and so his only method of defense is punching enemies with the circle button. If you've ever played The Legend of Zelda, I feel like you'd be right at home here since the perspective is the same, and essentially this game is just one dungeon from Zelda 1, only much bigger. Snake picks up weapons and items on his way through Outer Heaven, like a handgun, a machine gun, plastic explosives good for blowing up walls to find secrets, remote-controlled missiles that can shut off generators, a grenade launcher that fires 
grenades from a distance, a rocket launcher that does just that, and mines that blow up enemies when they step on them. Snake can obtain a lot more items than he can weapons, such as a cardboard box to sneak past guards and security cameras, a gas mask to get through rooms filled with poison, a compass to cross the desert, an anti-poison antidote to not take damage from the enemies in the desert, rations refill Snake's health, an oxygen tank to swim, infrared goggles to see lasers, a flashlight to light up dark rooms, the bomb blast suit to not be blown away on the roof, an enemy disguise to sneak into building 2, body armor that reduces damage from enemies, and lastly the parachute which you need to get from the roof of building 1 down to the courtyard of building 1. But the most important collectible in Metal Gear is by far the key cards. There are 8 key cards in this game and they open locked doors. In Metal Gear Solid 1, they make the key cards stack. Or in other words, a level 5 card would open a level 1 door, but you still had to equip the card. In Sons of Liberty, you automatically open doors that you have the cards for, and that's the best way the card system ever worked. In this game, it's a mess. For some reason, level 5 doors only open those doors, and the same thing applies for every other door in the game. And they aren't individually colored or anything, so at the end of the game, you'll be switching cards in front of doors for what feels like forever, and it just kills the pace. Especially when you're in a gas-filled room because you lose health in the process of switching cards. Metal Gear, like I said earlier, is a stealth game, and because of that, getting caught means the place goes on high alert and guards will come in running. But these guards are really stupid, so they can only see whatever is directly in front of their face, and so that can be exploited if need be. Ending an alert phase means defeating every enemy on the screen, and sometimes if you're lucky you can escape by hiding in select rooms. Later in the game, escaping enemies becomes easier since you can get a suppressor for your weapons so that firing a gun doesn't make as much noise. But trust me, in this game alert phases are very common. I, for one, got caught 134 times and had to kill 270 guards. Metal Gear has been considered a cryptic game by several people, similar to the likes of Zelda 1 or Metroid 1 on the NES, which solely left it on you to find your way with little to no assistance from the game other than poorly translated advice. I feel like Zelda 1 and Metroid 1 are pretty hard to go back to because of reasons like this, since they just aren't that fun to play in comparison to later games in their own series. I just don't understand why people say that about Metal Gear 1, since for the most part, I feel like you can get through Metal Gear 1 for the MSX without a guide. I repeat, for the most part. Sometimes you might need one to find specific things like the enemy disguise being behind a plastic explosive wall, but that's only for the impatient type. Many cryptic elements in this game are completely excused by the transceiver, or as it's called in later games, the codec. In this game, you only have four contacts, first being Big Boss, is useful for finding out what to do next, Kyle Schneider, who tells Snake where to find weapons and equipment, Diane tells Snake the weaknesses of bosses, and Jennifer unlocks specific doors so Snake can find equipment like the rocket launcher or the compass. Take for example when you fight the shop maker and you have no weapons. Earlier to bust out of jail, you're told by Big Boss to punch the wall to get out. You're supposed to connect the dots to punch the door to get your equipment back. If you still don't get it, you can call Big Boss again and then he'll tell you to do that. So really, calling your allies is all that needs to be done if you really can't do something yourself. Walls that can be blown up by a plastic explosive have a different sound when punched, so you know to blow it up. Like I said earlier, to get into Building 2, you need a disguise, and Schneider says it's in the Building 1 basement. And there are only so many places you can look, so eventually you'll find it on your own. The game has several hostages to rescue, and some of them give you advice. Rescuing 5 hostages means going up by 1 star, meaning you can carry more ammo and have more health. In original mode, you need to be the highest rank in order to beat the boss of Metal Gear, but in easy mode, you only need to be like rank 2 or something. In terms of difficulty, this game is pretty easy when it comes to running around in combat, but on your first playthrough you might die a lot. Be sure to have rations equipped in combat so they automatically refill your health when you lose it all. But upon dying, you don't just go back to the room you died in, but the most recent checkpoint, which are usually the elevators, which is where I recommend saving since like I said, these are guaranteed checkpoints. Other checkpoints usually come up in places that are tricky to get through, like rooms with invisible pits, or before the boss with Dirty Duck where you can potentially kill a hostage and bring your rank down by one star. So personally, my least favorite thing about this game is how in Building 2, there are two elevators on each floor, and there are only one way, and if you get on the wrong one, you have to go all the way through the wrong floor just to get to the other elevator just to get to where you need to be. It gets better on repeat playthroughs, but it's still very annoying. The bosses are completely pathetic on the other hand. Most of them require you to stand still next to them and shoot, the hardest one being the tank since it takes longer than the other ones, but the human bosses are a total joke. Even Metal Gear itself, since once you know the pattern, it's pretty easy, since Metal Gear itself doesn't even move! The final boss is just as easy since all it takes is four rockets to the face. After the game is complete, you can play through the boss attack mode, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. The game creates a solid atmosphere with some great 8-bit graphics and a memorable soundtrack, whether it be the overworld theme... The atmospheric basement theme. Climactic theme when fighting Metal Gear, whatever.
Metal Gear was very popular in Japan, and so for North America, a port for the NES was released. Which is a good idea on paper, but in execution, Metal Gear for NES is a mess. I used to reject the idea that these two are interchangeable, however some of the level design is the same, but this game is very poorly programmed and is easily one of the worst English translations I've ever seen in a game. The game has many things going against it, like how I got in a truck and was taken back to the beginning of the game and I get really pissed. Or how in the original you can walk out of a room that has ammo in it and then walk back in to get more, but if you couldn't hold any more then you were told so by the game. But in this game you can do this indefinitely, but still get nothing. But the biggest thing Metal Gear 1 on NES has going against it is the awful checkpoint system. Dying once with a level 1 star means going back to the beginning of the game. More stars mean somewhat better checkpoints, but this one flaw completely ruins the game for me. Even save states couldn't make me sit through this game, honestly. Sure, the NES game might be a classic, I guess, but the thing is, the MSX game is so much better and is easier to get since the MSX game was translated for North America in Snake Eater Subsistence, the HD and Legacy Collections, and the digital version of Snake Eater. I sure mind on the HD and Legacy Collections in order to play the MSX titles you need to boot up Snake Eater first, but still, they're on there. Also, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I'm very surprised Metal Gear Solid 1 wasn't at least given a port in the HD collection since Sons of Liberty is a direct follow-up, but that's just a side tangent. So overall, Metal Gear for the MSX is a great game. While it isn't the best game of all time, it's very fun. I personally don't think the game has aged that poorly at all. The game gives you most of the things you need to get through, the difficulty balancing is good, so I feel like this game is criminally underlooked, since I think this game is even better than games like Peace Walker. As for the NES game, I recommend avoiding it honestly, I think that one sucks, but I still think the real Metal Gear 1 is a great time and I recommend it if you like retro gaming. Quite frankly, I think it's a shame that the team who are making a remake of this game got shut down by Konami just by getting the green light from Konami before even starting, since I would have liked to see what they would have done with it. Anyway, while it is on my next review, the next time I look at a Metal Gear game will be my reviews of Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake for the MSX and Snake's Revenge for the NES. So with that, I'll see you guys later.